Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast, and today I have a special guest who's with me from Texas. He is both a nurse, an attorney, and a nurse practitioner. His name is Joe Flores, and I met him through LinkedIn when we were connecting, and I thought his background was fascinating. And I thought you would enjoy hearing from the perspective of an attorney who is looking at the law from a different perspective than attorneys who don't have a healthcare background. Joe, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Pat. I really appreciate it. And for all the viewers out there, I, I want to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Tell us about your journey, Joe. You started off as a registered nurse, uh, and then you became a nurse practitioner. I'm assuming that was the sequence. After a while, being in nursing, you decided to go on and advance your education, or did you do it all at one time? Well, Pat, um, I got out uh, with an associate degree in nursing when I was 20, like many of us, um, and I had been in healthcare since high school. Uh, got my RN early and uh, then went on for my BSN. And while I was working uh, toward my BSN, um, a couple of attorneys asked me to review some cases. I didn't know much about what they expected, but uh, they were excellent attorneys. Uh, worked my way through that. And uh, over the years, uh, right after I got my BSN, pretty much I, I went through that and working in ICU uh, for couple of years, uh, honed the craft of reviewing records and uh, providing expert testimony. Um, then subsequently, um, it, it, got, it went so well that uh, it helped me put myself through FMP and law school. And uh, so six mm. years straight of grad school, and it was, a, it was a great journey. And I'm glad that I learned that skill uh, because uh, uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to go through full-time law school, uh, at least for the first year, uh, along with the other things that I was doing. So it, it's been very rewarding. Uh, it's a great journey. Well, that's quite a story. It sounds like your introduction to law was maybe a combination of being behind the scenes consulting as well as doing expert witness work. That's right. Uh, now, um, as many of us uh, know that have been in legal nurse consulting for a long time, most trials uh, don't go. Uh, you may be deposed, uh, you may review a lot of records, get ready with your expert report, but uh, it just doesn't go to trial. And, and more and more frequently that's happening. I've tried a lot of cases, but uh, many are going to mandatory arbitration or not going. But nevertheless, the work of the LNC is very much needed because you never know when you're going to go to trial. And I can think of promises that I have been given, Joe, by clients when I was testifying as an expert who said, this will never go to trial. And then I got that phone call that says, this is going to trial. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. And that's why I say never say never in the law or in nursing or healthcare because things can just change on you. And, and they, they often do when you least expect it. Now, with your background in healthcare, I'm curious as to what type of law you practice now. Well, um, I am still doing uh, a lot of personal injury, uh, civil law. We're looking at, uh, even though the, the laws in Texas changed the last uh, you know, 15 years or so with tort reform, there still is a, a great need uh, for knowing medicine, healthcare, nursing, and the law all overlapping because of personal injury cases, pharmaceutical cases, which we're looking at. And uh, now, uh, through the regulatory side, administrative side, board cases, and uh, healthcare mm -hmm. fraud cases, which are uh, becoming more frequent, and then civil and criminal side of federal law. So, uh, many LNCs are surprised uh, that their skill set can be used on the administrative side of things, not ne just necessarily medical malpractice and negligence, but PI, building up the damages model. Uh, so we can show a jury what this person needs. I'm, I'm excited to see more LNCs looking at the vo vocational rehab specialty. So in a nutshell, I am looking at civil, criminal, and administrative law, and that's on uh, here in Texas and on a federal level nationwide. 
So it, it's uh, pretty challenging and exciting times for our firm. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the tort reform in Texas because I got into legal nurse consulting when there was no cap in Texas and there were some extraordinary Texas style size verdicts that many uh, insiders believed really killed the litigation climate or at least dramatically affected it in Texas, that there were excessive verdicts like 400 million for nursing home cases. Is it viable for legal nurse consultants to work with attorneys in Texas at this point with uh, the cap that exists? And can you share your perspective on that? Absolutely. Um, uh, many uh, individuals are, uh, worry about that, and that's a legitimate concern. Under Chapter 74 of the Texas Medical Liability uh, Improvement Act, that's under the Texas Practice Civil Remedies Code, Chapter 74, um, that pretty much um, stopped a lot of tort reform because it caps damages the type that are special to, uh, say, a nursing home patient and they injured them, uh, if they are non-economic damages, they're capped at 250 per defendant, uh, about 500,000 total. Uh, now, you can get punitive damages, but those are also capped. Now, everybody says, oh my gosh, you know, Texas, uh, the, the cap is really draconian. But if you look around the nation, there are similar, same or similar caps in about half the states. And some of the statute of limitations or time you have to bring the lawsuit are uh, limited um, uh, mm -hmm. to a year sometimes, uh, sometimes three. Uh, you know, I've seen in most jurisdictions about two average. But uh, to answer your question, uh, no, I, I think that a uh, legal nurse consultant can do very well in Texas. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll tell you why. M lawyers have adapted that do medical malpractice cases. And those cases, uh, particularly um, the medical malpractice and nursing home cases, we've learned how to do them more economically, save money. Uh, mm -hmm. Before, you know, when I used to, uh, when I was training and cutting my teeth in uh, the early 2000s before tort reform really kicked in, I remember a, a great mentor of mine said, now don't come home for mediation without at least $2 million. You know, uh, and and that's even you know, before, but but I never saw those really runaway verdicts, except on pharmaceutical cases and things like that. And those those are still there, but um, the the medical malpractice, I think it was more, and I'll never forget, it was in the year two thousand two that, uh, and they were getting ready to do the legislative session. Doctors marched right across the street where I am at here by the nearly Gulf of Mexico at Nueces County. They got off a bus, about 50 uh, doctors in lab coats, and started picketing in front of the courthouse. And I said, this is going to be a big paradigm shift. Unfortunately, I see it from the nurse practitioner and the medical side. I never saw insurance rates go down like they promised. They, being the insurance company, mm -hmm. made some bad investments at the turn of the millennium and then just said, hmm, how are we going? And I hate to sound jaded, but it's really true. I, I heard the legislators talking about it at that time. We were reaching out to them, but said they made bad investments. They said, how are we going to limit our exposure and how much we have to pay out? Well, we'll just cap damages and we'll get the, the docs to do our talking for us. And when you pit a doctor against the lawyer, the doctor wins with the public. You know, there's more trust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what happened. Uh, so the, the aftermath was that for many of us, we went out on our own because uh, there was no longer the business to do medical malpractice. So for about a year there, I free fell and I just took everything through the, through the door. Many of us younger lawyers went there and um, those uh, many, many uh, that handled only exclusively medical malpractice went under. But then the system adjusted and we're still having, we're still seeing medical malpractice cases. I, I have participated in some over the last five years. Nursing home cases, not as much, but they're making a comeback. Assisted living is there. Um, but uh, there, it, there are plenty of opportunities, bottom line, for those who want to practice in Texas. And uh, as I've mentioned, now we have the federal law, uh, key tam whistleblowing, um, and also DEA cases, nurse practitioners. Now, uh, with uh, the proliferation of them, there's a lot more uh, 
uh, lawsuits, and there's also a lot more opportunity to defend nurses in front of and uh, nurse practitioners in front of the board. It's just a very broad question, but it's a very good one. But I thought I'd, I'd try to cover it as best I could, um, the amount of time we have. But um, I do think there are great opportunities for LNCs, without a doubt, here in Texas. If you were giving advice to an LNC who is getting started and trying to build up a client base, what would you think would be the most effective ways to connect with attorneys? Well, I, I'd like to save that LNC the pain that I have been through. And that's <laughs> part of the reason that I'm here. Um, but, um, you know, I'm not going to go back too far. But when I was a six-year-old newspaper boy, I learned rejection very early on. People would yes. say, no, nah, no thanks, kid. I get it at home. I heard that about 50 times a day till I learned how to market it. And I started learning how to market by talking just like the old days, extra, extra, read all about it. I talk about the top of the headline. You need to see it now, that sense of urgency. Well, the same thing for LNC. I, I used to just go in there and I didn't really understand how the lawyers thought or the legal culture. Or even when I started getting comfortable, I never saw it behind this lens, the optic of being a lawyer. And so for your audience, I would say this very simply is, First of all, find out exactly what they work on. Some people work on um, brain trauma, TBI. I, I, I'm passionate about that. I was a nurse practitioner with a neurologist for a while mm -hmm. and, and also an ICU. And so I love working on these brain trauma cases because I liken it to opening up a, a box of eggs, always checking if it's cracked. Looks great on the outside. You know, you see these people with a TBI injury. They look like they can walk, talk just like everybody else, but people don't understand and appreciate the trauma that they've suffered. So that's one case. Like if you find out somebody handles those, that, that's really an in. That's a niche. And, and really doing your homework on the lawyers. But I would say it's hard to get in there with lawyers. But once you do get in there in your first case and work with them and, and tell them, you know, I'm passionate about what you do too. And uh, I, I really want to help and work on these cases. And once you find out, uh, especially what makes them tick, their story, uh, many personal injury lawyers I know have lost somebody to a car wreck, or I know one that, oh my gosh, it just breaks my heart. Um, he did go-kart cases and his son died because of that go-kart case. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it is just incredible how he can, you do that. And he shares a story in front of a jury, not exploiting that pain, but showing that vulnerability. And, and uh, you know, once we get beyond that one dimensional look at lawyers and say, hey, these guys are human too. They, these, these people get out there and advocate because they want to get their client's story across. Um, and so to those legal nurse consultants, that is invaluable. And when you get that foot in the door, let them know that you know exactly what they do, their verdicts, what they work, yes, touch upon their ego a little bit, you know, but also validate what they do. Um, and uh, when I started doing that, it was a watershed moment for me. I got a lot more cases. And then when I got my foot in the door, as you know, Pat, and I did a good job, uh, just like any good LNC does, they will call you back and they'll share your name with many other lawyers and you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. I think my perspective about plaintiff attorneys changed when I went to an American Trial Lawyers Association meeting early on when I first started exhibiting there and they were talking about the garage doors that used to close all the way down to the ground and then a child was crushed under a garage door that, that at that time the manufacturers didn't have that sensor device and it was because of the plaintiff attorney handling that case that the garage door manufacturers were forced to put in that safety feature, you know, and up to that point, I saw plaintiff attorneys from my healthcare lens of, oh, they're just hanging out in the hall waiting for us to make a mistake so they can sue us. And then I began to shift. There was another moment that I shifted, which is if you remember when, when um, HIV and AIDS was first coming to this country in the, in the 1980s, there was a, 
woman, and I believe her name was Kimberly Bergalis, who got HIV from her dentist. And they took a video of her laying on her sofa dying, and they showed it at this American Trial Lawyers Association meeting that I was attending. And there were attorneys who were openly crying in the room. And then I got it that there was that passion to represent injured people that I began to see for the first time. Yeah, very well said. Um, you know, when I, I'm part of a group of tr the trial lawyer college that was initiated by Jerry mm -hmm. Spence over 25 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to give away the Coca-Cola formula of how they teach us to be better lawyers, but they make you look critically at yourself and your own soul. Mm. And what makes you tick? Why do you, why do you react the way you react and critically look at it and say, if you don't know, you're not going to be able to tell the story and not be able to direct that story with witnesses and everything to your audience, the jury. And that is very compelling. And uh, so we did go through a lot of painful things, all of us have, to understand why uh, we do what we do. And, and that's it, uh, totally, is I can see that why I do what I do on, on, in many cases uh, when I've done the plaintiff work is seeing the, the most vulnerable in our society being hurt, injured, and that don't really have a voice. And uh, I think it's some of the most rewarding um, work that anybody can do. But I also agree with you. I, I, it took me a while for the optics to change. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, a nurse, I feared lawyers. I despised them. Um, I really didn't think of myself as becoming one. And then I started working on the work in my it was a watershed moment that the nursing home had lied about um, how much a person ate and they essentially starved them purpose uh, on purpose and and didn't feed them trays were stacked yet they kept putting a hundred percent fed 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 it's because of, they didn't have the time and they didn't want to lose their job so they would just say the person ate Mm -hmm. and, I, and that was the first one I ever worked on. It was a pretty simple case, but the, those, they, they, do, uh, they document dumped on the attorney like they do frequently. And so I had to find it over 10,000 pages of documents, and I found it. And that's uh, so what I said, you know, this is amazing because uh, um, I'll never forget, he sent me what was the equivalent of a month's salary. And I said, sir, you paid me too much. I only worked on this about you know, five, 10 hours, let me give you some money back. He's not, nah, you earned it. I settled that case for X amount. Um, and it was a, a significant verdict. I mean, it would have been a significant verdict. Uh, they settled it uh, before it went to trial, but his demand was much, much higher. Uh, but in any event, um, I, I totally agree with you. I get it. Um, and I think that as nurses, if we learn about legal nurse consulting, we can see it from both sides. And I think we grow personally from that. There is a persistent comment that legal nurse consultants hear from attorneys, and I know you've got a take on this, which is, I've got a paralegal. Why do I need a nurse? How would you respond to your brethren who are under the impression that legal nurse consultants are no better than paralegals? Well, I'll tell you, you know, um, uh, I, I, first of all, I know from seeing it from both sides, that um, I really, really respect paralegals. I see uh, how they put things together, but even paralegals know on a good legal team that without that nurse, much of the medicine and the issues and, and the smoking guns and the defenses, as well as the armor that we put on, whether you're on the defense side or the bullets that are piercing that armor uh, in, in using that metaphor of finding that chink in the armor, it is a ways and falls squarely on the nurse's shoulders that's a legal nurse consultant. Whether you're testifying or not, you are an invaluable part of the team and only the most uh, inexperienced trial lawyers don't get that, especially nowadays when, uh, as you said, and you, and you brought that up, and I'm glad you did, about tort reform that swept the nation in many areas. 
uh, we have to make a dollar travel farther and we have to make our damages models skyrocket up and prove that that person um, has activities of daily living that's been affected. If they have a traumatic brain injury that they cannot remember things, they might leave the oven on, they might kill themselves. Those kinds of things only nurses can see and nurses can educate the, the lawyer. So when I talk to my brethren, whether it's at a water cooler or at a dinner or at a, at a bar function or, or right across uh, the table in a war room, I tell them, where's your expert? That's a legal nurse consultant because we need this stuff reviewed right away. And not only that, but we need to know what kind of uh, life care plan we're going to get, vocational rehab. And uh, they start freaking out uh, because I tell them, oh, you're only settling this for soft tissue neck damage. Did the guy hit his head? Well, yeah, but he denied treatment and stuff. Well, we need to send him to a neurologist. We need to, uh, you know, see if we can do something about getting him checked out, CAT scan, MRI. And only a nurse can sift through all that and say, yeah, that makes sense. And instead of a $10,000 case, it's a six-figure, seven- or eight-figure case. And, and uh, I think that's how we sell to lawyers. And my share is that I tell lawyers, yeah, I'm a nurse. And, you know, you say, well, you're not an MD. And I say, well, if you want to pay, you know, thousands to an MD just to tell you you don't have a case, good luck. But if you want to have a nurse tell you, okay, on the one side, on the other side, and really take the time holistically to tell you what matters, that's why we're invaluable. Because we are trained on a holistic model. And we see things three-dimensionally, not critical of physicians, but they tend to be more cut and dry on, nah, this doesn't look like a case, move on. We're trying to find and help our lawyer. And, and that's why we're an invaluable part of the team. Those are great points, Joe. I want to bring up something that is one of the unpleasant aspects of working with attorneys, and I know you've had some firsthand experience with this, which is having difficulty getting paid. We do the great job that we're capable of doing. And you mentioned attorneys are needing to stretch their dollars further. Well, one of the ways that some of the more unscrupulous attorneys stretch their dollars is to say, I'm not going to pay my experts, or I'm going to go back to my experts. And I've personally heard this. I didn't settle the case for as much as I wanted. So therefore, I'm going to all my experts and asking them to reduce the bills so that the plaintiff will get more money in her pocket. Or variations of this. Can you give us some insight? Is there any way for us to spot any red flags that might exist when the attorney's first contacting us that this person's going to be a bad payer or a slow player or a no payer? Um. First of all, if they haggle with your price, uh, red flag number one. If you tell them my, uh, uh, my consulting price is, say, 175 an hour for a review. If I have to testify, it's 250 350 an hour. And, uh, you know, uh, five-hour minimum for review of documents and for testifying, you know, eight-hour minimum if I've got to go to uh, court and sit there in the hall. Uh, and same thing for deposition testimony. Uh, let me send you over my scheduling fee. If they balk at that at all, ladies and gentlemen out there, flag number one, let's give them a break, okay? Let's see how far they go. But then if they start really haggling and lowballing you, that should be just your first sign. And then if they say the worst, well, come on, you're not a doctor. Oh, my gosh. Uh, run. <laughs> run from that lawyer because – He's ignorant about his case. He's ignorant about his facts. He's short-sighted, and he's not going to pay, uh, and he's going to try to weasel out of it. And I've had that happen to me where the person didn't pay me, and I told you about this, uh, that, that he went ahead and subpoenaed me to go testify. And um, the opposing counsel asked, why are you here? And I said, because he subpoenaed me and forced me to be here. But I'm going to tell the truth about the case. Wow. Okay, the jury just automatically, and that's how you got them. And I was only telling the truth. I didn't mean to ruin the case. or I was just telling the truth. I'm under oath. Uh, but I think the way to prevent that, I, uh, after that lesson learned, I, I get an ironclad contract, a non-refundable retainer of half of the money up front. And sometimes, uh, you know, that's all you see. 
Uh, so you want to get paid and, uh, and be a little cynical about it and say, well, you know, if I was going to ask for two, if this guy's giving me my spider sense is creeping, I'm going to ask for three grand retainer. And I'm going to ask him, what kind of records are we looking at? If they minimize the records, if they minimize the work, that's another red flag, but not necessarily a killer. I mean, uh, attorneys are going to negotiate, right? And, yes, but sir. there's a way to do it. Like if uh, Pat, if you tell me, all right, five grand, I'll say, this case is a little light. You know, I mean, we're, we'll luck if we get 100, but let's do it on the outset. Can you, can you do it for 3,500? I've got two other cases. Now, that's a good attorney. And then you counter maybe 4,500, you got a deal. I'll look at the others. And, and if they're not as uh, onerous, I might do it for a few thousand and, and maybe give you another discount. That's how we deal, you know, but, but not in the way that they're demeaning or, or condescending or saying they don't value your work. Know your worth and know what attorney you're dealing with. And when you ask for money, if they start right off the bat trying to lowball you, that's a bad sign. If they're slow paying, it's best to get as much funny of, of, of it as you can up front, put it in trust and bill against it. And uh, I ask for Square, PayPal, cashier's check, and uh, or their trust account check from an IOLTA account. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty much, they start messing with that, they can get a lot of trouble with the bar. But yes. those are the ways, and a good contract in place. Uh, I've got some templates, I'm sure you do, that we can share with our people out there that are listening. And that way they don't get burned. But uh, that's my experience over a couple of decades. And I know you've been uh, through a lot of things and, and that you share every, every week with people. And so, but, but I hope that helps a little from my perspective. Yeah, that is great, great advice. Because sometimes those red flags are very obvious. Sometimes they're subtle or they're missing. And there's a, an underlying current of bitterness that exists in legal nurse consultants who have done great jobs for attorneys and have not been paid. There are some inexperienced legal nurse consultants who have spent way more hours than is reasonable and they haven't gotten paid. And they're even angrier because they've put in a lot of time. But some of it may have been totally unwarranted and part of the learning curve. So there's a lot of subjectivity to this issue, but I see periodically in the listservs that I, I monitor comments by people who haven't been paid, who, who sometimes they're just ready to throw in the towel and say, if this is what legal nurse consulting is all about, then forget it. I don't want to be part of a profession where I do work and I don't get paid. And, you know, and I think that's part of the tragedy of losing talent from our field who have been turned off by this issue that's right that's right and, and uh you know I, I i say this to all my brethren uh, my brothers and sisters in nursing that want to get into this field uh, you know stay tuned with us right here on uh, uh, you know on your program and uh, i'll be delighted to share any knowledge i've got um and uh try to try to give them some pointers but First of all, is just letting the letting uh, the ner uh, the the uh, the lawyer know from the get go. If you're new to it, say you know I I'm I'm relatively new to this, but you know I've taken a course of study and and I know how to review records, and I'm not going to waste your time or mine. Uh, that kind of sets the stage, and they say, well, mm -hmm. you know I don't need for 20 hours on a on a banker's box of records, and they're right. That shouldn't take more than a few hours. But what does take a lot is research and generating the work product. And uh, sometimes, yeah, you'll look at a couple of boxes of records and I've heard that, well, it shouldn't have taken you more than five hours to do this, you know? Yes, Say, well, so yeah. yes. well, yeah, but you sit there and then we have to do the chrono on it. And you know, it's just the way you negotiate and tell them now that, you know, say if you give me a banker's box of records, I kind of factor in, it's gonna be anywhere from one to five hours on that. And I'm going to have to generate a report and a chrono, and that might be a couple more hours, but I'm not trying to milk you, or I know it's going to come out of your client's pocket, ultimately. So I want to do what's right for the client, as do you. But I'm going to try to give you a work product that's cost efficient. And yeah, I, I did have to, in my experience, have to eat a few hours when I first started. I did get stiffed a few times, but I learned um, that um, how, to, how to really uh, pick 
uh, the right attorneys to work with and also charge them fairly and sometimes waive a couple of hours on there. And even on my billing, I'd put no charge on, you know, a couple of things, you know, 0.5, 0.15 or uh, 0.25 or 0.5 or a quarter hour, half hour. And they see that and appreciate it. There's some things you didn't charge mm -hmm. for. And, and uh, it's all a part of the marketing and it comes with experience. But I tell any LNC, don't give up. There are many more good attorneys out there that are going to pay you than the ones that are going to stiff you. Uh, you can't get too cynical, but at the same time, you've got to take the initiative to be prepared. Street smart and book smart is what I say. <laughs> That's, I haven't heard that expression, but boy, does that apply. You can't really be effective unless you have both pieces in place, can you? Yeah, it's like working in ER. You know, yes, they teach you nursing, but they don't get you ready for ER or long-term care or when you get out there in the, the boots. Remember when we were all nurses and we first started out, we'd say, wow, I didn't sign up for this. But then as we become more experienced, something wonderful happens. It's an art mm -hmm. as well as a science. And the same thing here, please don't give up. We need more of you all to bring the legal, uh, the legal field and nursing field together because we do so much for those clients that need us. And tell our listeners how they can find out more about you and the services that you offer. Anytime you guys want to call, uh, please call 24 hours a day. I've got an exchange, uh, 361-887-8670. If you're like me, I forget a number as soon as somebody tells me. So it's 361-887-8670. But if you like flowers, flores is flowers in Spanish, F-L-O-R-E-S, and just add law firm.com at the end of that floridaslawfirm.com because mostly everybody loves flowers so remember, excellent floridaslawfirm.com and be aware that there's more than one joe flores as an attorney in texas because i spoke to another one when joe and i were initially connecting <laughs> thank yeah. you joe yeah i've really enjoyed our time i, I wish um i wish i could share more of my experience and and things like that but i'm writing a course book and I'm trying to get it perfected. I'm not a great prolific writer like you. I've read your stuff. I love it. The passion, everything that you're posting. I thank you for it. It's making me a better lawyer, making me a better MP, making me a better expert when I review other cases. But uh, I, I just want to say that I'm trying to get a course together for LNCs that are just starting out that don't want to plop down $10,000. And I'll and I'll do it very, uh, very inexpensively, but we're working on it to give it quality. It's got hyperlinks. It's going to have video in it. And I'm going to help people as best I can from the lens of a legal nurse consultant turned lawyer. And it's a unique lens. And I thank you, Joe, for sharing that perspective. Thank you, Pat. I, I can't thank you enough for having me on the show. I'm honored. And I think some of the takeaways that I've gotten from listening to Joe is that if you are Working with attorneys, particularly plaintiff attorneys, look at what you can do to help um, flesh out the damages. The jury doesn't understand what's in those medical records, and the attorney often doesn't have the time or the expertise to get deep into the medical records, and that's where we really shine. We should be sure when an attorney comes back to us and says, well, I have a paralegal who can do this, to point out the difference between being able to just read the records versus interpreting and analyzing them and knowing what's behind those records. The scenes in the healthcare are often ones that the paralegal has no experience with, provides valuable services for attorneys, but doesn't usually have any medical background and might miss the things that would be obvious to you as a legal nurse consultant. And I think Joe stressed very carefully and nicely the fact that we shouldn't get discouraged and bitter about attorneys who don't pay us. There are plenty who will. You've got to stand your ground and negotiate and be firm in your terms about what your payment process is and know that the value that you bring deserves to be well compensated. So I think I've hit at least some of the highlights of what Joe shared and, and appreciate so much, Joe, that you've been with us. And to you, the listener who's been listening to this podcast or watching this on our 
YouTube channel. Thank you for investing your 30 minutes to be part of this show. Thank you. I appreciate it. I look forward to maybe popping in again. Sounds good.